This evening, if you would, uh, well, okay, we're going to be looking at uh, Revelation 20. Feel free to turn up in your Bibles if you want to, that's fine, or you can uh, follow along uh, on the uh, screen behind me. By the way, you may notice that what I read and what you read may be just a little bit different. Um, I should explain. I really should get a new Bible. Um, I had the old NASB that was, I think, put together in 1975, but then there was a later revision. And sometimes, in my notes, I'm using the later revision. As I'm reading from my Bible, I'm using the earlier version, so there's going to be some discrepancy on what you see from what I'm reading and what's up here. But I think you'll see that it's basically saying the same thing. So Revelation 20, as you know, the favorite text of so many churches, uh, this is the only text in Scripture that speaks about the millennium. So this is where we're going to begin. What we're going to be looking at, well, actually several things, what the millennium is, uh, what churches actually disagree on regarding the millennium, but we're not going to look so much at the character of the millennium as to when Jesus Christ is coming in relation to the millennium. So let's begin by reading Revelation 20. John writes, And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he should not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark upon their forehead and upon their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. They came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne. And him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now let me just remind you, we're not going to be looking at everything that's in this passage, uh, although I do believe it can be explained, uh, I think, very simply. But we're going to be focusing on the thousand years that are mentioned in this text, because that is the millennium. That's what the word means, a thousand, in this case, a thousand years. Now, this morning, remember, we were considering Mark 13. Mark 13 is the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus was explaining when the temple and its surrounding buildings were going to be destroyed, that this text was not really dealing with the future with regard to us, but with the past with regard to us, the future for the disciples at that time. He was talking about God's judgment upon Israel for their rejection of the Messiah. Now, the idea that these events are yet future 
and involve the nation of Israel, as I mentioned this morning, are part of a system of belief called dispensationalism. Big word, but um, one that a lot of people are familiar with because dispensationalism is perhaps the majority view of most evangelicals today. Most churches that you would attend, uh, independent evangelical churches, hold to this position. But I think you know by now that just because many people hold a position, or even most people hold a position in a church, or the churches in general, doesn't mean that what they believe is true. Now, we already critiqued their view of Mark 13, and in doing so, in some sense, uh, Matthew 24 and 25, which is a parallel passage in Matthew's Gospel of the Olivet Discourse. But this evening, we're going to consider another view that they hold called premillennialism, the idea that Jesus returns prior <coughs> to the thousand years mentioned in Revelation 20. Now, it's not that I'm wanting to pick on dispensationalists in particular, because we realize that they are a part of the church. It just so happens that on these issues, we have the strongest disagreements with them. Now, tonight, what I want us to do is look at three things. First of all, what the millennium is. Secondly, what the differences of opinion are on the millennium, just generally. And then thirdly, why we believe or why we should believe that the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ cannot be premillennial. It can't be before the millennium, but it has to be after the millennium. Now, what I'm going to try to do is deal with this in a nutshell. So we are going to be moving a little bit quickly. I hope it's not going to be too difficult to follow. I'm going to try to keep it as simple as I can. But sometimes when you can lay everything out at one time and you can see the whole picture at once, it makes it easier to understand. And that's one of the things I want to try to accomplish in this series is to lay out in simple form, at least as simple as you can on a very complex issue like this, uh, you know, why it is we may disagree with the premillennial position. So first of all, let's consider what the millennium is. I've already told you the word itself means 1,000. And I was thinking about reading through these texts again that include it, but I hope you, you heard as I was reading through Revelation 20, the numerous times the word 1,000 actually occurs. Let me just give you one or two examples. Verse 2, And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And again, it occurs in verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, and verse 7. This is where the Bible teaches the millennium. Now, do we believe in a millennium? Well, of course we do, because anyone who believes the Bible has to believe the millennium because that's what it teaches. There is a thousand years here that we need to understand. I mean, we not necessarily agree on what it is, but we know that it's here. So what is the millennium? Well, the millennium is this time frame of a thousand years. Now, all churches agree that there is a millennium, but there are areas in which we disagree. Um, in several areas, as a matter of fact. Now, let me explain some of the different opinions quickly before I tell you where we should stand and why. The first thing has to do with the character of the millennium. What are these thousand years going to be like? Well, there's two basic camps. One that says that a thousand years is going to be a time of great struggle, where the two kingdoms are fighting one another, uh, kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light. And others, not surprisingly, see it as a time of great blessing. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that you know, two groups or whatever, you can have these differences of opinion within the church, because we often do vary, sadly, uh, on opposite ends of the spectrum. Now, some do believe it's a time of warfare between the two kingdoms, that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan are basically fighting, and it's a neck-and-neck -neck battle. Sometimes one of the kingdoms gains ground, perhaps through a revival, and that would be the kingdom of God, of course, and other times the kingdom of darkness gains ground during times of non-revival. 
Those who hold to this position basically believe that towards the end, the kingdom of God is going to lose ground as Satan is released at the end of this thousand years. But the church is going to be rescued at his second coming. So it's a struggle, and it's a downward trend, and then Christ comes and rescues us. Whereas others believe it's really the time of Christ's victory. That the two kingdoms are going to be at war, but that the kingdom of God will, by God's grace, and by, uh, well, again, differences of opinion, uh, perhaps a worldwide revival, or perhaps just through the work of the, of the church, seeking to advance the kingdom, that the kingdom of God is going to become so powerful that everyone will submit to the rule of Christ. When Paul says that every knee shall bow, that that is referring to this world before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, ushering in a time of worldwide peace and prosperity. Now, those are the two positions. There are, of course, variations of that. Dispensationalists believe that the millennium is going to be a time of peace and prosperity, but it's going to be essentially Jewish in nature, where the Lord fulfills his promises to Israel, gives them the land uh, that he promised that they, that they believe they never had, rebuild the temple and reestablish the sacrifices. Life is going to go on kind of as we know it now, only much uh, better, but they believe, of course, that's after Jesus returns. But there are others who believe that this time of peace and prosperity is basically God's fulfillment to his church of the promises that he has made, and especially that he might honor his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is reigning right now at the right hand of God over all the nations of the earth. That it's the time when the Father has subdued the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ under his feet, and now they are submitting to him, and as they do, and they walk in his ways, the Lord brings blessing, as he promises, upon those who will actually obey him. So again, all believe in a millennium, but some believe in the differing character of the millennium. Some think it's going to be a struggle and a battle. Others believe it's going to issue in victory and peace and prosperity. Another area of disagreement is the duration of the millennium. How long does it last? Now, you might think that's sort of a slam dunk. I mean, the word means a thousand. And we've read over and over again this term, thousand years. You think that we would all agree that the time frame is actually a thousand years. Now, it wouldn't be that difficult, except we need to recognize that this, this phrase, a thousand years, appears in a passage that is highly visionary and prophetic. And the Lord himself tells us that when he speaks through a prophet, he speaks through dark sayings. He doesn't speak openly and face to face as he did with Moses. Moses being the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, really. And the Lord distinguished how he spoke with Moses versus how he speaks with prophets with Moses openly face to face, with prophets through dark sayings, almost riddles in symbolic language. Well, I hope you would recognize with me that the book of Revelation is highly symbolic. And the rules of interpretation for this kind of literature tells us that we should only take things literally if we are compelled to do so in the context, but otherwise we would expect it to be a symbolic number. And there are several indications in the passage that the thousand years are symbolic, a nice round number, you see, of a period that could be much longer, a thousand being basically a perfect number of completeness. Now, we're going to come back to that in, in just a little bit to see another reason why we believe the number is actually symbolic. So we disagree on the character. We disagree on the duration. And then we disagree on when the millennium actually takes place. And that's really what's behind all of these terms that we use. Uh, perhaps you've heard them before. I mean, I've already used one of them. Pre-mill or pre-millennial. Jesus comes before the millennium. When does the millennium take place? Well, it comes after he returns. That he will usher in a time of great blessing and a peace and prosperity in the world as he begins to take up his rule directly, and basically the nation submit to him. 
But then you have these other terms, these other words, amillennial or postmillennial. They believe that the thousand years must take place before Jesus Christ comes again, between his first coming and his second coming. Basically, amill or amillennial, if I can use the abbreviation, amill and postmill, believe that we are living in the millennium now because this is the time between the first and the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before you get too excited, either by the fact that we're living in the millennium, isn't that wonderful, or by the fact that you thought the millennium was actually going to be much better than this, you need to realize that all mills and post mills are divided on basically the last point on whether the millennium is going to be better than the rest of time. I mean, all mills, and literally that term means no millennium. When you put the A in front of the word in the Greek, it often, although not always, but often negates the word no millennium. Now, it's not that amillennialists don't believe that there's a millennium. We just read about it. It's a thousand years, right? They have to make sense out of that thousand years. But what they mean is there is no millennium like the postmillennialist believes. <laughs> it's not going to be worldwide peace and prosperity. It's going to be a battle all the way to the end. The postmills, on the other hand, believe that there will be a time of peace and prosperity, a time of blessing, a time of submission to Christ, not like dispensationalists believe with a distinctly Jewish character, but a time when all the nations bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, walk in his ways and experience his blessing before he comes again. By the way, I should mention that um, even though there is going to be the peace and the prosperity and every knee bowing, they do not believe that everyone is going to be saved. There is going to be a time when more will be saved than usually are saved, but the rest are going to bow the knee, as it were. I wouldn't want to say against their will, but certainly it's not from the hearts. It's feigned obedience because the Lord Jesus Christ reigns in his power, and they know that not to submit to him would be foolish. Again, as Psalm 2 calls upon all the nations to kiss the son, lest he become angry in the day of his power, uh, we read in the Psalms that even his enemies will give feigned obedience to him. So again, we all believe in a millennium, but we do disagree on the character of the millennium, the duration of the millennium, and when the millennium actually takes place. Now, where should we stand with regard to the character of the millennium? Should we see it as a struggle all the way through? Or is it going to be a time of peace and prosperity? Well, just take your pick. <laughs> It, it's, it's actually, I mean, we, you, know, you have to decide what you're going to believe with regard to Scripture. Now, our denomination in general believes, uh, and our church in particular, we're really divided. Probably more people believe it's going to be a time of struggle than that it's going to be a time of peace and prosperity. But I can't get into that right now. It's too big of a subject. We may perhaps look at that next time. What does the Bible say about the character of the millennium? What is going to happen during this time frame? So in, in this denomination, we are divided. What about the duration of the millennium? Well, here we're relatively united, seeing the number as symbolic. Now, we really don't know how long it is, but we do believe, for the most part, that it's longer than a 1,000 years. Now, here's where I wanted to get back to that particular subject. The book of Revelation, chapter 20, tells us that the thousand years begins with the binding of Satan. Look at verse 2. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Notice the thousand years begins with the binding of Satan, and it ends with the loosing of Satan, just before Jesus Christ returns. Now, I believe that that's what the text is telling us in verses 7 through 9. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. 
and they come up on the broad plain of the earth and surround the camp of the saints in the beloved city and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Now, the idea basically is, is this, that um, realizing that Revelation 20 is, is highly symbolic, when the angel comes down and takes hold of Satan and binds him, puts him into this abyss, binds him for a thousand years, he's chained up, that he is not bound absolutely, but rather he is bound that, as John puts it here, that he may not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. The idea is that Satan is bound for a period of time that allows the gospel to be proclaimed throughout the whole earth and that Satan may not keep the nations in darkness any longer. We do need to realize there was a time when he was able to do that, when there was light only in Israel and the rest of the world was in darkness. Well, when Jesus comes, he binds the strong man so that the strong man or Satan may no longer uh, keep the nations in darkness and the gospel may go forth. We're told specifically when Jesus was challenged by what, by what power and authority he cast out demons and was accused by doing it in the name of Satan, Jesus defends himself in this way in Matthew 12, verses 28 through 29. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter uh, the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? Now basically, this view sees the binding of the strong man who is clearly Satan and the plundering of his house to be exactly what John is referring to here when the angel takes Satan and binds him for the thousand years so that he may not deceive the nations any longer. Now, at the end of the thousand years, Satan is released again, and he, he institutes a worldwide persecution against the church. That's what is in view here with regard to gathering the nations and coming on the broad plain, surrounding the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But then fire comes down from heaven and devours them. That is the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ because we're told in Scripture again and again when he comes that his return will be characterized by fire. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 through 8. Paul says, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So Jesus, in his earthly ministry, binds the strong man and begins the plundering of his house, which goes on for a thousand years, and then it ends with Satan's release as he is released for a short time to gather all the unbelievers against the church. And then the Lord Jesus Christ comes again in flaming fire to save his people from that persecution. And then comes the judgment. We read in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 32. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and that's, of course, the same time that he reveals himself in flaming fire and judgment, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him. Remember, we just read that He was going to come with His mighty angels. Then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him. And then will come, of course, the judgment. Well, what do we read in Revelation 20? As soon as Satan is released, gathers the nations together against the camp of the saints, and fire comes down and destroys them, the next thing we see is... And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. The books were open, and the dead were judged from the things that were written in the books. This is the final judgment. So the consistent testimony of Scripture is this, that Jesus binds the strong man, plunders his house for a thousand years. At the end of that time, Satan is released, but then time of persecution, at the apex of that persecution, Jesus returns 
and he destroys them, but then sets up the throne for judgment. Now again, that means that the thousand years is the time between his first coming and his second coming. And how long has it been already between the first coming of Christ and his second coming, but nearly 2,000 years? So if the millennium is in fact the time between his first and second coming, and it's already been 2,000 years, then obviously the number is a symbolic number. And that's the point I was trying to make there. Now again, I said as a, con as a denomination and as a church, we're relatively united here on the duration of the millennium being a symbolic number. There are a few premillennialists in our denomination, not dispensationalists, but what, what are called historic premillennialists who do believe that when Jesus returns, he will usher in a thousand years, a literal thousand year period of peace and prosperity. It won't be distinctly Jewish, but it will be the fulfillment of the Lord's promises to his church and the glorifying of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, the millennium is a thousand years and there, every church, every Christian believes in a millennium, but we have differences of opinion with regard to the character, the duration, and when it actually comes about. Now that brings us to the last point, which is what the title of the sermon is all about. Can the millennium come after Jesus returns? We just, I just gave you an argument for why I believe the millennium actually comes in between his first and second coming. The question is, is it possible that Jesus could come and then the thousand years could take place? Well, it really can't be the case for the following reason. And that is when Jesus returns, according to the whole New Testament, he is going to put a definitive end to the world as we know it. There cannot be a thousand years following his coming of the continuance of life as we know it now. Now when he comes, the Bible says that several things are going to take place. And I'm going to tell you what those are and then we're going to look at them and then we're going to review that and that will be the argument. The Bible says that when Jesus Christ comes again, several things are going to happen. He's going to raise all the dead, the resurrection. He's going to translate all the living, the people who are alive when he returns. He's going to gather the dead and the living together in one place at one time for the final judgment. After the final judgment is going to be the final separation, some into the new heavens and new earth, others into the lake of fire. Sometime between the time he raises the dead and the final judgment, he is going to renovate the creation and bring in the new heavens and the new earth and at the same time create the lake of fire. Now if all these things happen when he comes again the second time, if that is in fact what the Bible says, then there can't be a thousand years of earthly history that follow his return because the world as we know it will be gone and everyone who's ever lived will either be in the new heavens and the new earth or in the lake of fire. So you wouldn't, you, the world is not going to be here anymore as we know it and all the people are going to be disposed in one place or the other. So you can't have a thousand years of a peace and prosperity in the situation that we're in now because this situation isn't going to exist any longer. So let's look at each of these quickly to see that this is what the Bible teaches. First of all, when Jesus comes again, he is going to raise the dead. And he's going to raise all the dead. Now we read that passage for our meditation at the very beginning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says when he descends, the dead in Christ will rise first, but it doesn't mean they're the only ones that are going to rise. We read in actually it's John chapter 5 verses 28 through 29 Jesus says this an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment notice an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come first. Now that will come forth. 
That includes the dead in Christ that we read about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. They may come forth first, but they're not the only ones coming forth. By the way, I should mention that when the resurrection is referred to in Scripture, it is always called the resurrection. When the Sadducees were asking Jesus, we saw this not too long ago about the, the, uh, the, the woman who was married to the seven brothers, they say this, in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had married her. Now, notice they didn't say, well, in, the re in this resurrection or in that resurrection or in this resurrection over here, but they say in the resurrection. And the reason why they can ask that question is because they understood there was only one. And that's exactly what Jesus says. And in that one resurrection, all the dead are going to be raised. Now, getting back to the other passage, 1 Thessalonians verse, or chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, when he comes to raise all the dead, at the same time, he is going to translate, I guess that's the best word we can use, all the living. Those that are alive and remain will be caught up together with those who have already risen from the dead who are Christ and meet him in the air. But he is coming to gather for judgment. The wicked dead are also going to be raised and the wicked living are also going to be transformed so that everyone can be gathered together for the final judgment. In Matthew 25, verses 31 through 33, Jesus says this, that when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for the deeds in his body, for his deeds in, in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or evil. There's going to be good and evil before the judgment seat of Christ. All are going to be there. All the nations are going to be there. All who have ever lived and all who are alive at the time of his coming. Throughout scripture, that judgment is called the judgment. Again, in the church today, there's this desire to divide all the judgments up to the, the Bema seat judgment of Christ, the sheep and goat judgment, the white throne judgment, and they say these are all different judgments. But yet, this is what Jesus says in Matthew 12, verse 41. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. What judgment is he referring to here? The Bema Seat judgment, the sheep and goat judgment, the white throne judgment? If there were three different judgments, he might distinguish which one it is, but he says it will be at the judgment because there is only one judgment. And then after the judgment, there's going to be the final separation. Then the king in Matthew 25, 34 will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he will say to those on his left, verse 41, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. All the dead are raised, all the living are translated, all are judged at the final judgment, all are separated, eternal life, and eternal punishment. There's nobody left to go into, as it were, an, an earth if it continued as it does today. Everyone's separated. You're either in one place or the other. But remember, too, at the time he raises the dead, this is the time when he's actually going to change the present heavens and the earth and bring in the new heavens and the new earth where there is no sin any longer, no wickedness, no disease or suffering, which, again, pre-millennialism believes is going to be taking place in the millennium. When he comes again, he is going to set the present creation free from its slavery to corruption. And Adam sinned. It brought a curse on the whole creation. 
It's the reason why we have the things we have in this world, sickness, disease, tornadoes, and so forth. But this is what Paul says in Romans 8, verses 19 through 21. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now these references to the revealing of the sons of God and the freedom of the glory of the children of God, Paul tells us specifically in Romans chapter 8, has to do with when those who were believers have their bodies redeemed. And that is at the time Jesus returns and raises them from the dead, raises them incorruptible, which is what will happen when he returns. And at that time, Peter tells us the day of the Lord, at the time when Jesus Christ comes again, that the present heavens and the earth, that this, this freedom from corruption that it, it's, it's desiring right now, when it takes place, it will take place as, as a basically a, a cosmic explosion where the present heavens and earth are going to be burned up and the new heavens and the new earth will come. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with the roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Notice when Jesus Christ comes again, the day of the Lord, that there's going to be the passing away of the old heavens and the old earth, the bringing into the new where there is only righteousness. There is not going to be more, any more sin, any more death, any more sickness in the new heavens and the new earth. And that's why we believe there cannot be this continuance of life, this millennium on earth after Jesus returns because he's going to have brought in the new heavens and the new earth. So if all these things are true when Jesus comes back, the dead are raised, all the dead. The living are translated. Everyone is judged. The final separation takes place. The old creation is destroyed. The new heavens and the new earth come in their place and everyone is either in the new heavens and the new earth or in the lake of fire, there cannot be the thousand years, the millennium, that follow. Premillennialism cannot be the right view. So, of course, this only leaves us with two other options, and that is the all-mill and post-mill view, which, of course, we can't settle this evening. Either the two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and light, are going to continue to struggle neck and neck until the second coming, or the kingdom of God is going to triumph in this world before Jesus Christ returns. Now let me just say this, that if it's true that the kingdom of heaven is going to triumph, then the Lord's return is still a long ways off from our perspective right now. And we still have a great deal to do before Jesus Christ returns. Now that's what I would like for us to consider next time. That if, in fact, you know, the Lord is going to bring worldwide peace and prosperity, if it is going to come through the preaching of the gospel, if there is to be worldwide revival, then there is time before Jesus returns and there is work to do, work for the church, the Great Commission. Go and disciple the nations, Jesus says. That still remains to be done. But for now, let's consider these things. You know, premillennialism teaches that when Jesus Christ returns, there's going to be a tribulation period and a time of repentance. And maybe if you were raised in a dispensational church, you've probably heard that scenario. You know that idea that a Jesus can come any time. His coming is imminent. But if he comes and you're not ready, you've still got seven years to get ready. You've got this tribulation period, but you need to realize that there isn't a seven-year tribulation period following the second coming of Christ. When Jesus Christ comes again, we've already seen what's going to happen. Resurrection, translation, judgment, separation, new heavens, new earth. No seven years. When Jesus comes, that's it. A definitive end to the world as we know it. There is nothing then but judgment and separation. So you need to make sure that you are ready 
when Jesus comes that you will be numbered among his sheep. Now, what if postmillennialism is true and Christ's coming is still a long ways off? Doesn't that give you plenty of time? Well, you might think so. But when are you going to die? Doesn't death put a definitive end to our preparation for judgment? Well, it does. The Lord can always come for you at any time, at a time when you're not even expecting, because none of us knows the time of our death. So we have to be ready at all times for the coming of the Lord, even if it's not his second coming. We need to be ready when the Lord says our life is over and it's time to meet him. The only way you can be ready is by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone to make you right with God. You must turn from your sins. You can't just say, I believe in Jesus and live any way you want to live. I don't know if you noticed this. I hope you did. Maybe it shocked you. That in every place that the judgment was mentioned, it said that our deeds are going to be judged, our works, according to what we've done, good or bad. It's based upon the kind of life that we're living because our lives show our character. And our character is determined by whether we're trusting in Jesus or not. If we are, we have his spirit within us cleaning out the inside and making the outside clean as well. Jesus reproved the, the uh, Pharisees, remember, by saying you're like whitewashed sepulchers. You look beautiful on the outside, but inside you're full of corruption. He says clean out the inside first, and then the outside will become clean. It's exactly what Jesus does when he comes into our lives by his spirit. He cleans out the inside, and the outside then becomes clean as well, which means we begin to live the way the Lord would have us to live. And so when he judges our lives, he will see a pattern of good deeds instead of evil. That is the evidence that we are truly born again. So trust in the Lord. Turn from your sins. If you're able to do that and you're able to uh, repent of your sins and follow the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will know that you are ready to meet the Lord. So may God grant that all of us would be ready at all times if the Lord should come for us before his second coming and also if he should happen to come in his second coming. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a few moments of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would help us to be ready by trusting in the Lord, turning from our sins.